uh, welcome everyone to the analysis seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Shanmugalingam uh, from University of Cincinnati, and uh, she will speak on prime and boundary potential theory and quasi-conformal theory in metric setting. Thank you, and thank you for a kind invitation to give a talk at this seminar. And uh, uh, if you don't mind, I'll stop the, my video so that I save bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so my talk is about prime and boundary potential theory and quasi-conformal theory in the metric setting. And uh, this is based on joint work with many people, including Anders Bjorn, Jana Bjorn, Tamash Adamovich, Dewey Estep, Jeff Lindquist, and Josh Klein. And I first learned about primates from a course in complex analysis given by Fred Gehring in 1995 as a graduate student. I also thank uh, Alano Ancona for bringing this topic about primates and their connection to uh, Martin Boundary in 2000 at the Institute Mittag Leffler. I miss the days when you could go to conferences in person and talk with people very informally outside of the talks. Uh, I hope that comes back again. Uh, this work is pa partially supported by the Taft Foundation of the University of Cincinnati and by NSF grants. So, the, a little bit of the background regarding prime and boundary is that if uh, in complex analysis, we know about conformal maps between simply connected planar domains that are not the entire complex plane and the unit disk. So the natural question to ask is that if you have a conformal map uh, between the unit disk in the planar domain and a simply connected planar domain, when you said that you can have a continuous or a homeomorphic extension of this function, uh, this uh, conformal map to the closure of the unit disk to the closure of the domain omega. And sometimes, I mean, of course, asking for homeomorphism is a little bit more than asking for continuous extension. Sometimes you can get continuous extension that need not be homeomorphic. So for example, if you deal with the slit disk in the complex plane, and you have a conformal map from the regular disk D to the slit disk omega, then you can see from uh, looking at, let's say this green part of the boundary of this disk gets mapped to one side of this slit. And the yellow part gets mapped to this from the other side of the slit. So there is some point in this yellow part and some point in this green part gets mapped to the same point on the boundary, but there is a way of unique, there is a way of extending this mapping to the closed unit disk so that you have the extension from the closed disk to the closed disk in this way. But this mapping is not going to be homeomorphic because it's not injected. And how about just asking for continuous maps, continuous extension, and even that need not always be possible. So here is an example. This is the so-called uh, topologist form or a harmonic form. So if you look at the conformal map from this topologist form to the unit disk, and look at what happens to the two sides of each of the slit. So from this, for this slit, the two sides get mapped to two arcs in the boundary of this disk. And that happens, so there should be a gap between here. Sorry about the picture being very imprecise. I was trying to pack too many things in there. So what happens is that these two gets mapped to the, uh, from here. And these two got mapped from here. So there's a folding of the boundary that is going on. But lo let's look at what happens at the points here. If I look at, say, this point, say on the boundary of the disk, 
and I look at sequences from the disk that converge to this point, depending on where this sequence is coming from, the corresponding limit might approach this point or might approach this point or might approach this point. So depending on where, how you approach this limit, there may not be a well-defined limit on the closure of this um, uh, topologist comb, which is the rectangular region. So even in this simple case, we may no, not have such a possibility. So for simply connected planar domains, Caratedori's solution was to actually think of replacing the topological boundary of these domains with the so-called prime ends. So what are these prime ends? So let's uh, consider the recipe corresponding to the prime end. To construct the prime end, you first start out with cross cut C, which is a Jordan arc in the domain omega, except for the endpoints which are on the boundary of the domain. And in addition, you want to make sure that the complement of this cross cut consists of exactly two connected components. And then you say that a sequence of cross cuts is a chain if so one skipped over terms in this sequence. Uh, let me find this out. Two of these terms in this sequence are separated by the one in between. So Cn and Cn plus two are separated by Cn plus one. So they are in the different components of omega minus Cn plus one. And a chain is a prime chain if the uh, limit of the diameters of these cross cuts is zero. And then there's a way of saying, what does it mean for two prime chains to be equivalent? And then using that equivalent relationship, we get the equivalence class of prime chains to be prime ends. So let's look at one example here. So in this domain, if you start with, say, C1 is one cross cut, okay? and this cross cut divides your domain up into two pieces. One is this piece, and the other is this piece. Now, C2 can go either inside this piece or outside here. But once you have chosen the side, you are forever have to keep choosing that same side, because now, if I want to look for, say, C3, C3 has to be divided away from C1 by C2. So C3 cannot be inside this region. C3 is forced to be in here. Okay. And here in this side, I have also included a copy of the uh, topologist form. And if you look at this, this sequence of cross cuts forms a, a chain, and this chain is a prime chain. So it's a chain, its equivalence class is a prime end. And notice here that the diameter of each of these cross cuts goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So, oops, did I? Okay. So, Karen Theodore's theorem tells us that if a domain, a simply connected plane, a domain in the complex plane, if it is not the entire complex plane, and if F is a conformal map on the unit disk to the domain, then it extends as a homeomorphism. Uh, from the closed unit disk to the uh, so-called so prime end closure of the domain omega. So this is omega union, the prime end boundary. So to talk about homeomorphism, I have to explain what the topology on this union should be, but uh, I'll 
give the explanation in a more general context. So I'll skip it for the interest of time in this. So the problem, there are some problems with uh, Karatidori's uh, construction of time ends. I mean, it works perfectly for the case where you are uh, only interested is in studying conformal maps. But if you are dealing, uh, say, between uh, simply connected planar domains, but if you are dealing with, oops, I lost my phone. Okay. If you are dealing with a non simply connected planar domain, then cross cuts may not even separate the domain omega, let alone having exactly two connected components. And in addition, what are the higher dimensional analogs of cross cuts? So these are some issues that come up with. And in metric spaces, it's even more mysterious what a cross cut should be. So, and in addition, the third objection I have with uh, uh, Karen Theodore's construction of time ends, even in the case where you are dealing with a simply connected planar domain, is that from the point of view of potential theory, the prime and co uh, corresponding to this topology comb is not ideal. So if you notice here, if I have this corresponding prime end, all of these points on this edge, this border, get collapsed into one prime end. All of these correspond to just this single prime end that we are looking at. But that means if you're trying to solve, say, a Dirichlet boundary value problem, say, try to find harmonic functions with prescribed boundary values, and if you think of the prime end boundary as your boundary, uh, where your boundary data should be defined, you're essentially insisting that your function is extended on this entire line segment. And then if you want your function to be continuous, then that means uh, the values on each of these segments have to converge towards the same constant value. But from the point of view of, uh, say, Brownian motion, which is equivalent to solving the Dirichlet boundary value problem for the regular Laplacian, is that if you start from anywhere here and if you let around uh, Brownian motion run, it is not very likely at all that the Brownian motion would end up with this as the first hitting time. So why should values of the function here determine how the parts behave all the way out here, what the payoff function should be or what the boundary data should be? So I would like to see a construction of a prime end that does not require your boundary data to be dictating how the value of the functions to behave along these slits as you get close to here. By the way, if there are any questions, please do not hesitate to speak up and ask. Okay. So we came up with an alternate notion with the uh, Anders Bjorn, Jana Bjorn and uh, Tomas Adamovich. We came up with a alternate construction of prime ends. And this is truly alternate in that it does not always correspond to the Karatidori notion, even in the simply connected planar domain. I'll come to that a little bit later. So if I have a domain in the proper metric space X, so proper meaning that closed and bounded subsets of my metric space are always compact. And so if I want to talk about um, prime ends, so first we define what you mean by a bounded prime end. So I start with what are called acceptable sets. So a connected subset of a domain is called acceptable if its closure uh, intersects the boundary of the domain. And it is bounded, hence the name bounded prime end. Remember, we talk about the metric space being proper. So if E is bounded, if and only if E closure is compact. 
And in addition, we have a sequence of, if a, we have a sequence of acceptable sets, this sequence is called a chain if you have these three properties holding true. The first is the nestedness property. So if you think about the Kalatiodori notion of time ends, so if I have this domain and I have these cross cuts, then I have the corresponding to the cross cuts, I have this, uh, each complement of each cross cut gives me two connected components of the domain. And I choose the connected component that contains the subsequent cross cuts. So this gives me a nested sequence of sets. So that is the nested sequence that I consider here. These EKs are the nested sequence of acceptable sets. But I want to also make sure that they are separated, their boundaries are separated from each other. So the Mazurkiewicz distance between the two boundaries inside the domain have to remain positive. And the third condition is that the intersection of the closed, the closure of these acceptable sets is a subset of the boundary. So no stragglers are allowed to remain inside the domain omega. So this should not contain points from the domain omega. And then we talk about well, chain dividing another chain. If for every positive integer k, I can find, so for every positive integer k, and I look at f sub k, I can find sub n sub k, a tail end of this chain that is contained within this f sub k. Okay. So it's a nestedness property. And we say that two chains are equivalent if they divide each other. And this gives an equivalence relation and an n is an equivalence class of chains. And then n is a prime end if the only n that divides it is itself. So this, the nomenclature count is motivated perhaps by number theory here. But uh, this idea of division and a prime end, if and only if it divides, the only thing that divides it is itself, in the theory of prime ends comes from the work of Alfors. And so if your domain omega is bounded, then that's the end of the story as far as construction of prime ends goes. But if your domain omega is unbounded, then we want to also talk about prime ends at infinity. So if I have, so if I have a set E that is not bounded, we say that it is acceptable at infinity if it is connected and it's a connected component of a complement of a compact subset, if this should be, um, this is a typo, this should be omega, omega minus k. Sorry about that. So E is a component of omega minus k, and I'm afraid this typo is going to show up at the next slide. <laughs> Okay, so, and then once we have these acceptable sets, we can talk about the nestedness property and that their boundaries should be separated from each other in the Mazurkiewicz sense. And also that uh, talking, uh, by insisting that it should be a prime end at infinity is obtained by insisting that the intersection of this closure of EK is empty. And we can talk about division of one n by another, sorry, one uh, prime chain by one chain by another. And we can uh, use that to define 
uh, equivalence classes and ends as before. And every end at infinity happens to be a prime end automatically. That is, if one end at infinity divides another end at infinity, then the other end also divides the first end. So that's the equivalence relation. And if you have an end that divides an end at infinity, then that end is also an end at infinity. So all of this is consistent. And this ends at infinity, I mean, there's this role with this abstract uh, compact set K, which whose complement is supposed to be EK, but this is just for flexibility. But there is a standard representative that you can take for each prime end at infinity, namely complements of balls. Mm. Uh, excuse me, Nagis, can, yeah. can I ask a question? So when you say E is a component, do, do you mean a component? Do you mean is contained in? No, it is. It, it is, is a not the, It's not that it's a contained in, but it is a component. Okay, so it's actually like one of the connected components of... Correct. The, yeah, right. okay. Right. Yeah, I used to call it a connected component. And then uh, I think UC Vaisala had this lecture notes where he uh, sounded very annoyed when he said, of course, a component is a connected component. What other component are you talking about? <laughs> so I stopped calling it a connected component. I just say component. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, being efficient leads to <laughs> confusion. Um, so the standard representative is where you are looking at components of complements of balls. So here is a picture. <clears throat> so my domain is this funky looking thing, okay? including the part that keeps going out here. And I uh, says fix a point in my domain and I look at an increasing sequence of balls and I look at components of the complement of these balls so if I look at the <coughs> excuse me if I look at the first ball it has one two components well let's say let's take this component and then I look at a slightly larger ball it has one two three components and so I'm taking this second component, the blue shape. And then I look at this larger ball. The complement has in this picture two components. And I continue to take this component. So, so this sequence of components forms an end. So <clears throat> then there is another third type of prime ends, which is neither a prime end at infinity nor a bounded prime end. So these are called, not very appealingly, unbounded prime ends. So we say that a connected set is unbounded acceptable if its closure intersects the boundary of the domain. And of course, E is unbounded. And the sequence of such acceptable sets is a chain if you have this nestedness property and the distance between the boundaries being separated like here. But these two are the additional conditions. Let me explain the fourth one first. Unlike if I had emptiness here, if this had been empty, then I would have had a uh, prime end at infinity. So this is the other case where this intersection is non-empty. In the case that this intersection is non-empty, uh, in addition to having that the Mazurkiewicz distance between the two uh, boundaries being positive, I also want to be able to separate the two Mazurkiewicz boundaries, uh, sorry, these two boundaries inside omega, 
by a compact set, JK. And here again, as usual, division of one chain by another can be given, and then we can use that to define equivalence classes. And then n is a prime n if the only n that divides it is itself. So in this case, not all unbounded n's are prime n's. So here is a picture. It's an example of an unbounded prime n that is not a prime n at infinity. So notice here that this is like a, a winding tube that just keeps winding around and keep going out. And in the acceptable set, the first one is, let's say this part all the way down here, all the way to here and so on. And the second is this part. The third would be this and so on. So what you get is, the tail end of this infinite pair. Uh, so Sergey says diameter of compact is always finite. It's not absolutely right. Yes, you don't have to say it out again. Correct. But if you think back to Karatidori's definition, he needed the separations to be uh, going to zero. Right, the diameter of those cross cuts to go to zero. We do not have that. Okay, Sergey. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. So notice here that in this uh, example, the if you look at the intersection of the closure of all of these acceptable sets, it contains this line, this red line that keeps going out. And here is a non-example of an unbounded prime. This is an end, which is not an prime end. So the first acceptable set is this one, the one below this red line. And the second acceptable set is this one. Third is here and so on. So these red lines are boundaries of these acceptable sets. The black lines, are uh, parts of the boundary of the domain omega, which is contained, which is essentially a whole bunch of floating boundaries inside this half infinite rectangular region. So prime and boundary consists of all of these types of prime ends, the bounded prime ends, the prime ends at infinity and unbounded prime ends. So now let me explain what topology we are going to consider for the uh, taking the union of the domain omega and the prime end boundary together. So this is essentially you want to consider a topology on this union so that when you restrict the topology to omega, you get the original topology, the metric topology back. So you want to in some way stitch omega to the boundary, the prime end boundary. So we do that by talking about sequential topology. So if I have a sequence of points in omega, we say it converges to a prime end if the tail end for each chain or each acceptable set in a chain in this prime end, the tail end of the sequence sits inside this acceptable set. And you can have a similar definition, well, slightly modified for a sequence of prime ends to converge to a prime end. 
but notice that no sequence of prime ends can converge to a point in omega. So this is truly a boundary. The prime end is truly a boundary. And so we get a topology by considering this sequential uh, notion on this uh, prime end closure, quote unquote, of omega and the prime end boundary of omega. And uh, one useful uh, notion to consider in the prime end theory is the so called impression. So, impression of an end is the intersection of all of these the closure of each of these uh, acceptable sets in a chain there. And this is always a subset of the boundary. It could be empty, right? So if you have a uh, prime end at infinity, then of course this will be empty. And we say that a prime end is a singleton prime end uh, an end is a singleton end if the number of elements in the impression is exactly one. Okay. So if you think about the, say the slit disk, and one um, possible prime end would be this sequence. Another possible prime end would be, say, let's say this sequence. They both have the same um, the same impression, that central point there, which is extremely large dot there now. Sorry about that. But what happens there is that they both share the same impression. So the impre it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the prime ends and their impressions. So they could share a common impression. I guess, uh, can I ask another question? If you add the point at infinity somehow, like a, like a one point compactification, do you, do you then like the, do the prime ends at infinity then are they like the other ones in one of the other categories? Absolutely. So you could, uh, so in the case of, uh, say, planar domains or domains in Euclidean spaces, you can, you know, uh, think of Rn as one point compatification gives you Sn plus one, right? So the sphere in uh, Rn plus one. So you could do something similar for met unbounded metric spaces. You can so called sphericalize them. If you do that, then the uh, ends at infinity are exactly singleton prime ends corresponding to that extra point infinity that you put in. Absolutely. Thanks. So there are some properties of prime end topology here. So this is where the problem starts, right? <laughs> where, what are the properties? Uh, the you would expect that the prime end closure would be a compact and it need not be, right? Not even sequentially compact. And the reason why I say I'll talk about sequential compactness is because compactness is not necessarily equivalent to sequential compactness because the prime end uh, closure need not be metrizable. And here is one stumbling block. I, this I do not know an answer to. Is it true that every end is divisible by a prime end? I do not know. So if, if your prime end, if the impression of a prime end has one point in it that can be accessed by a path within the prime end, then the answer is yes, you can divide by a, even a singleton prime end. But if all of the points in this impression are somehow inaccessible, then I do not know if with, a, with an end that has all of its uh, points in the impression be inaccessible, is it then divisible by a prime end? That's not known. 
So because of this reason, so if, uh, this does not have much of an impact, I think, in terms of trying to study uh, Kalatidori type extension theorems, but it has an impact on doing substantial things with uh, potential theory. So if in potential theory, if you think about, say, trying to prove some kind of Perron uh, solutions and you want to have, say, comparison theorems, you need to retract in. When you do a comparison, you need to retract in. And when you retract, you want to get a compact subset of the domain omega. And unfortunately, if I do not know whether every end is divisible by a prime end for that domain, I cannot get that. So if I have a domain where this is not true, then I don't know comparison theorem. But for many domains, we do know this is true. And for those domains, there is a rich uh, theory of uh, potential theory that we can uh, study. On the other hand, if I look at uh, the single, if I look at the singleton boundary, so that is the all the prime ends whose impressions are singleton prime uh, singletons. This subset is metrizable by an extension of the Masukevich matrix. And here's uh, some there are some nice topological consequences. If I look at the prime end boundary and I throw away the uh, prime end at infinity, then I get uh, the remaining prime ends, if all of them are singleton prime ends, if and only if the domain omega is finitely connected at the boundary. So let me explain what, that, what I mean by that. So domain omega is finitely connected at the boundary if for every, so let's say if I look at, so the, all of this is, the yellow curves are part of the boundary. So if I look at a point, let's say on the boundary, and I look at sufficiently small ball centered at the point, and look at the intersection of the ball with the domain, uh, then I get, let's say, this patch, this patch, this patch. So only finitely many connected components inside the domain that fits inside this ball. So that is called finitely connected, omega being finitely connected at the boundary. So having singleton prime ends is equivalent to having every point on the boundary, the omega being finitely connected at each and every point of its boundary. This finite connectedness at the boundary should not be confused with, excuse me. So this uh, finite connectedness at the boundary should not be confused with the local connectedness properties of the boundary itself. Though in the simply connected planar case, It is, and this result is due to Marie Torhurst uh, in her PhD thesis in 1918. And Lasse Rempe, I thank for pointing out her PhD thesis to me. For bounded domains omega, the peak capacity, so if you are doing potential theory, the one of the potential theoretic uh, tools that we have in access is the so-called peak capacity. The peak capacity, so in the case of classical potential theory associated with the Laplacian, P would just be two, right? So the two capacity or the logarithmic capacity in the case of the plane. Um, so the peak capacity of the parts of the prime and boundary that is not singleton prime and boundary that peak capacity is zero. So the parts of the prime end boundary that is not singleton prime end boundary plays minimal role in Dirichlet problem. And this is what we were aiming for. So in the case of the uh, harmonic comb or the topologist comb, uh, that last edge that was an accumulation of a lot of slits, 
that edge does not play any role at all. So here is an example of a domain where you don't get metrizability. And uh, so here the black slits are part of the boundary of the domain inside this rectangular region. And these red lines form the boundary of one family of accept, uh, acceptable sets or one family of chains. And the blue lines are boundaries of another acceptable chain. And both of these share, and both of these are part of a prime end. So this is one prime end, and this part is another prime end. And both of these prime ends have impressions that intersect. Now, if I take a sequence of points in my domain that con converge in the regular Euclidean topological sense to this, uh, to the one of the common points in the common impression, then I have a sequence that converges to this prime end, and it also converges to this prime end. And these two prime ends, the red prime end and the blue prime end, are not equivalent. They are not the same prime end. So I have a sequence that converges to two distinct points in my prime enclosure. And that tells me that this space is not separable, nor metrizable. So the topology can be quite um, not so nice, to put it politely. But on the other hand, uh, if I uh, go back to quasi-conformal theory, what we were able to show is that, so this is now joint work with uh, uh, Jeff Lindquist and um, Josh Klein. And so if I have two domains, omega and omega prime in a doubling quasi-convex proper metric measure space, And the restriction of measure from the global metric measure space to the domains are Alfos regular with respect to the Mazurkiewicz metric and support of Poincare type inequality. Then the quasi conformal map, any quasi conformal map between these two domains has a homeomorphic extension to the, their respective prime enclosures. So, in other words, for such domains omega and omega prime, we have a Kalatiodori type extension theorem. But notice here that I've already put quite a lot of uh, restrictions on what type of omega and omega prime we are allowed to consider. So they have to be alphos regular with respect to the Mazurkiewicz metric and support a Poincare type inequality. So these type of restrictions um, mean that the domains omega and omega prime are both necessarily finitely connected at their boundaries. So their prime and boundaries, uh, their prime and uh, are either singleton prime ends or prime ends at infinity. No other prime ends, no other complications that happen. So in some sense, this, there must be some requirements here because the conformal map from the unit disk to the topologist form has no such extension as a prime enclosure of the unit disk is sequentially compact, but the prime and boundary of the topologist form is not sequentially compact. The reason for that is because if I look at Let's say this is my topology score. And if I look at points here, this is a sequence of points that has no limit in the prime and topology. 
So point here has a prime end corresponding to it, but none of the points here have any prime ends corresponding to it. They do not, these orange dots do not belong to any impression. So that makes the topology storm a little bit wilder from the point of view of this constructed prime end theory. So we don't have the full generality of Caratidori's extension theorem. Our prime end construction is distinct from Caratidori's construction. The situation for the so-called branch quasi-symmetric maps is different. So a homeomorphism between two metric spaces Z and W is branch quasi-symmetric. If, if I have another homeomorphism eta, which controls the rate of growth of diameters of pairs of continua, if I have E and F are two continua in the Z that intersect each other, then if you look at the diameter, the ratio of the diameter of their images is controlled by the ratio of their original diameters. The control being given in terms of this homeomorphism eta. So this notion of branch quasi-symmetric homeomorphism, you could ask, okay, what do you mean branch quasi-symmetric homeomorphism? There is no branching happening here. The terminology is a little bit unfortunate because this is not, uh, I mean, uh, the branch, the definition of branch quasi symmetry is allowing for uh, non homeomorphic maps. So you are allowed to have branched, but here we are looking at homeomorphisms, but these are not quasi symmetric homeomorphisms. A branch quasi symmetric homeomorphism need not be a quasi symmetric homeomorphism. Quasi symmetry uh, generalized uh, deals with three points rather than two continua. Oops. Every quasi symmetry is a branch quasi symmetric homeomorphism, but the converse need not be true. So there are branch quasi symmetric homeomorphisms that are not quasi symmetric homeomorphisms. An example is the mapping from the disk to the slit disk. That mapping is a branch uh, quasi-symmetric homeomorphism, but it is not quasi-symmetric, but it is quasi-conformal. On the other hand, not all quasi-conformal maps are branch quasi-symmetric homeomorphisms either. The example is given by the mapping from the disk to the topologist the conformal map from the disk to the topologist form. So this is just a brief skit of why that is the case. But in the interest of time, I'll just leave that up and move on. So what we were able to prove is that now for quasi-conformal maps, I had to put a lot of conditions on the domains omega and omega prime, but the mapping was just quasi-symmetric, uh, sorry, quasi-conformal map. And then the conclusion was we have this homeomorphic extension. Now here in the for branch quasi-symmetric maps, those are well-behaved enough that I don't need such restrictions on my domain. So if I have two domains in complete doubling locally path-connected proper spaces, And if I have a branch quasi-symmetric homeomorphism from one of them to the other, then there is a homeomorphic extension between their two prime enclosures. And these homeomorphic extensions have an additional nice property that, that they map bounded prime ends to bounded prime ends. They map unbounded prime ends and prime ends at infinity to unbounded prime ends and prime ends at infinity, those could switch around. But bounded prime ends are mapped to bounded prime ends.
So this is the picture as far as quasi conformal maps go. But as I mentioned before, from the point of view of potential theory, what uh, our construction of prime ends was quite uh, satisfactory for us. So I would like to end the talk by acknowledging those who have not been so acknowledged. Uh, some of the parts of the research was conducted during discussions between me, Josh Klein, and Jack Lindquist at my department during the last year. And uh, without the efforts of the custodial staff at the University of Cincinnati who maintain the university fa facilities, this would not have been possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? I think there was a remark uh, midway uh, saying diameter of uh, compact is always finite. Uh, it is not uh, necessary to require it, but uh, it was kind of in the middle of a talk. I think she addressed, I think <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, she okay. addressed, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know um, if the, okay, maybe while people are thinking of what questions to ask, uh, can I ask you if you could go back and explain the example that you skipped because you said uh, there was not enough time? Oh, sure. With, uh, yeah. Let me. Uh, did I? It was after, oh, yes. yeah, there this it is. One. Okay. So here, if you notice, uh, the disk, oops, yeah. The disk got mapped to this topology storm. Now let's take a look at, uh, let's take this blue curve in the disk and this, and let's say that this is the point that got, you know, by the calculatory result, got smeared out towards this entire edge. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking at uh, these sets F, which are connected sets. And let's look at E and F. Right? So E is this line segment, which is a compact connected set or continuum. F is another compact connected set, a continuum, they intersect. Let's look at their image. So E is something that looks like this. Okay. F is something that, so if I, as I move, as I move F along this arm towards this circle, the images move from going into this slit to going into this slit to going into the next slit and so on, right? So look at what happens to these slits. The diameter of this slit divided by the diameter of this slit remains bounded away from zero. Right? Whereas as I move this slit F closer and closer to the boundary, its diameter is going to shrink. So the ratio here either goes to zero or to infinity. Either way, it violates the condition that we require. Okay, yeah, and, uh, and you had another uh, example where uh, you showed why it is, how the branched is different from just quasi-symmetric was, uh, I think that was just mentioned in words. Can right, you... so here, um, oh, that was uh, the quasi-symmetries that are be, uh, branch quasi-symmetric, but the converse is not, in general, right? So the disk to the slit disk. So let me draw the picture here again. So here is the disk and the slit disk. The slit disk got truncated a little bit there, but so if I- We can imagine. Okay. So from the point of view of uh, DQ as homeomorphisms, I'm considering continua, right? So if I consider continua like this, and I look at their images, they have to 
be like this. So if I look at the diameter of the, the ratio of the two diameters, they are comparable to the ratio of these two guys. Right? But from the point of view of quasi symmetry, that's a three point condition. So now I have to look at three distinct points here. If I look at, let's say, this point, this point, and this point, and look at their images here, here, and here. The ratio of the distance between these two points and this point is very small. Right? The ratio between these two points to this distance point is large. So there the quasi-symmetric condition is violated. But what saves us in the branch quasi-symmetric case is that you are not allowed to look at just three points. You have to look at the curves that join three points, right? So uh, connected sets. So that forces us to have the largeness of those. So if I look at, say, a curve that joins these two, uh, these two purple points, that curve has to go all the way around here. Immediately, we have that the diameter is comparable to the diameter of this guy, right? So, that's what saves us in the terms of branch quasi-symmetry, and we don't have that in the regular quasi-symmetry. So it's more of a, like dealing with the intrinsic distances instead yeah. of yeah. the ambient distance. Right. So what this says is that if you have, so you bring up a good point here. Uh, so instead of uh, when I consider quasi-symmetry, if I use the Mazurkiewicz metric rather than the Euclidean metric, then these two conditions are equivalent. Branch quasi-symmetry and quasi-symmetry are then supposed to be equivalent. Absolutely. I have to admit, I don't know what this Mazurkiewicz metric ah, is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to find a place where I can write. Oh, I can write here. So, the mass, if I have two points x and y, the Mazurkiewicz distance between the two points x and y is the infimum over all, all compact sets gamma in the domain omega connecting x and y. So, that means x and y are elements of gamma. And then you look at the diameter of gamma. I guess uh, this is also in some literature called the inner diameter distance. I, I guess there is no uniform naming of things. So in the Polish school, this is called the Mazurkiewicz distance. Ah. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I was only familiar with the one where you take curves, but this is very different from curves mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you you can cross through obstacles here, yeah. Right, right. 